So what I've got is that I'm able to retrieve one of the classes in my database. This, the whole point of show class table function is to process the data that I get from the previous function. And we're seeing that through this syntax, which particular row of data, which particular cell do I display? That's the syntax. We need to create a loop. So uh, let's say after, after that string, we'll start a for loop, F-O-R, for a certain number of times, do the following. So the for loop. The for statement has a very interesting syntax. It's one of the most unique ones. Well, first of all, we have to define our starting point. We're going we're gonna to loop, let's say, seven times. So we need to say, OK, we're going to start with our zeroth time, first time, second time, third time, fourth, etc. So we need to define our starting point. Then we need to define our condition. As long as we have you know, five rows to show, as long as we have seven rows, as long as we have 99 rows to show, do the following. And then we have an increment. Well, do it again, do it again, do it again, until we reach the limit. So first we start off with our starting point. We're going to create a temporary variable inside of here. Traditionally, it's i for index equal to 0, semicolon. We're starting on the 0 with value. So var i, 0, semicolon. The condition is i less than data dot length. Data is a bunch of items, has a bunch of items in an array. That's an array. So give me the length of the array. Mine is currently set to 3. So as long as we do this up to 3 times. Semicolon, I++. plus plus. So we increase I. We start with 0 to show the 0 with block of data. And then uh, the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So what we want to loop is this statement right here. This one that we wrote. Let's cut it and paste it, or let's move it into the for loop. This is the algorithm that will let us do this multiple times. What we want multiple times is that string. We want to do this over and over for the zero with one, the first one, the second one, third one, fourth one, ninety-ninth one. However, that's still going to show only the third one. So in my case, it did it all of those times for only one. So we don't want the hard-coded number two. We want i. If I created i, set it to 0, we're then borrowing it right here. 0. Zero. <coughs> 0. So set now your data, your index of your data array to i, which will start off as 0 the first time. It'll, it'll check, is 0 less than 3? Yes, so it does it. Plus, plus. So 0 becomes 1. It does it again. Data 1, etc. Is 1 less than 3? Yes. So then i plus plus 2. Data 2, etc. Then we've got is 3 less than 3? No. So it stops and gets out of the loop. So make sure each of these is now data i instead of data 1 or 2 or whatever. i is our variable that stores our current iteration. Now I'll, I'll test it, show, 
it is. So data 0, data 1, data 2, data 3. I had 4 in total. I less than 4. So 3 is less than 4. 4 is not less than 4. 4 is equal to 4, so it stops. 5, obviously, is not less than 4, so I wouldn't even get that far. But 4 is not less than 4, so it stops. 1, 2, 3, 4. If I add another class, class 6, 7, 2, 2, B, and this is Japanese 2 with instruction. Go. I have to click go and I have to click show. It would be nice if the table automatically updates. We can do that. We will do that. But for the moment I have to show the table after I go and I've got the next number. Now, it's not putting it simply in order of when I saved it. It is putting it in alphabetical order. If I put a class 002, and that's math, well, let's say that's calculus 2, click go, click show, it organizes it automatically at the beginning because db.alldocs ascending true. Got the data out of the database, ascending order based on CRN, based on ID, and therefore put it as first, even though I just added it last. It's an ascending true. So now I should have real data in a real table. Did that work for everyone? Is, is anything wrong? Well, I have this data. <coughs> I'm doing uh, the, the operations of a real database, right? I'm saving data. I'm restoring data. What else can I do with a database? Besides that? Edit data. Edit data. So I want to edit this. Well, I, I, there's two kinds of edits, right? There's edit the data or delete the data. We're going to do those both in just a moment. This one here, I might want to delete it. I might want to have functionality to delete it. Or I might have functionality to edit it. So this, this, uh, This uh, algorithm here is, is displaying the data, and once it creates the table here, this is the part that creates it row by row, this for loop, then we display it on screen. Right there. We close the table, we display it on screen. So we write some HTML into that div. This is a string full of HTML and dynamic data. So it processes it as HTML in the div. Let's build first a way to delete data. That one's a little, that's a little easier. It's a little straightforward. I've got one row of data that's gibberish. I want to delete it. To start off with, we will have the delete method kind of difficult because if we delete this, it's gone we have to build a way to retrieve deleted data if we want to have an undo functionality. For the moment, we will say there's no undo. You delete it, it's deleted. But we're going to make it a little harder to delete. We have to have, we'll set it up so that the person has to uh, type the CRN of the class they wish to delete. Instead of having a button to delete, which would be pretty <coughs> permanent, I want a way for them to type the class they're trying to delete, then it'll delete. So we'll say, in addition to displaying a table, after the table, I then want to have extra features, extra buttons, a delete button, an edit button, or something. So let's create, after the table, we'll add more to the string, a horizontal rule.
So I like this because we're going to build a string, do different things, and then ultimately it just gets output to the div. So that's going to be there with nothing changed. The, changing, the change is going to happen within those two lines. So show the table. We built the for loop. We built the, the algorithm to, to loop through our data to display a row after the table then we will set up a way for a person to delete a class. So we'll add another string. We'll add more to the string. We'll create an input field. Where we want them to type the CRN number. Uh, type equals text. Again, single quotes because I'm using the double quotes to wrap the whole string. Input type text. Placeholder. Single quotes. An example of a, of a CRN. And then an ID. BTN delete class. It's not complete yet, but what this does is after the table, now we will have an input box where I can type class 33J and then click delete. Well, we need a button. But this creates an input, an input field dynamically. We've written HTML to be created after clicking a button via JavaScript. So we have the input field. <coughs> and next to it, we'll create a button. We'll do button we can do input type well let's do it that way, let's see what happens. This is slightly different from my example. We'll see what happens. We'll do input of type button. This will probably work fine, we'll see. So input type of button value delete class. And then an ID. Wait a minute. Uh, this btn delete class, it's not a button, it's the input field. So um, let's call that actually in delete C delete class. Not a not a BTN. This is the input back up there. This is the ID for the input because we need to retrieve what the person typed. BTN delete class is the ID for the button we just created. They both need an ID. So for that input type of button we gave it the value attribute and then the ID attribute and that's the one that will have single quotes BTN delete class. an input to accept the class, and then an input of button to make it go. Checking that result should give us that. I expect the person to type a class there, so 657, 
five, six, seven. We'll make it easier later, of course, that if we click on a class, it'll make it easier for us. We have to manually type it, then we will delete. It's manual because if we delete it, it's deleted, unless we build in, unless we code undo. We won't do that yet. So it is hard for them to delete it. That's on purpose. That was a user experience choice. I want it hard to delete a class so that they don't make a mistake. So the way this will work is we have a button which should then trigger some JavaScript. We have a pouchdb method, uh, you know, db.delete or something, to delete the data from the database. The data in the database is all tied to underscore id. So ultimately we'll have something like db.delete the particular id in question, which is what they're going to type into that input field. It's back up to line 41 or so. This is where we're putting all of our... we're not there. Uh, a little higher... where is it? Oh, you yeah, know, there it is, yeah. Uh, this is where we're setting up our, our methods for clicks. I'm consolidating all of the places where someone will click on something to do something. And what we're doing here, we have L button save and L button show, right? L button save, L button show, L button cancel. We haven't done anything with it, but it's there. We have these elements that we created for IDs that exist. For IDs that exist. We can't quite do the same thing for something that's dynamic. It doesn't exist yet. As soon as you run the project, that delete button does not exist. That delete button is not there until we click show classes. Now it exists. So the code here is looking for something to create an element of that exists. We have to do it slightly different here. Next line. We have the We have btn delete class, which doesn't exist until a little later. What makes it tricky is we need to first specify the element that does exist, and then we can specify the element that doesn't exist. We have <coughs> div result does exist. Eventually, inside of that, we have btn delete class. So we're going to say on the div result element, when we click the button that will exist, then launch the rest. So dollar jQuery selector quotes div result results oh, no we have it up here l div results <coughs> dot on click This looks similar to what we've already done, but here's the here's the difference now. We're going to give it an extra an extra argument here before the function. These work fine because that element exists when we want to click. We're dealing with a dynamic element, so comma quotes pound btn delete class comma fn delete class.
targeting the element that does exist. Once we click the element that gets created dynamically, then run the function. So that's worthy of a note. First target the element that does exist. After click, target the dynamic element. Then run fn delete class. So this is how we can target an element that doesn't exist. Before it exists, we target the parent element first. We need to then define function delete class to actually then delete the class. We'll go back to the end of our code, <coughs> and we will define our function delete class. the end uh, function show class table. Uh, I should make the note here end function show class table. And then I'll define <coughs> function delete class. Okay, so this is the function that will delete the class. We need to check what's the class that the person typed. So we'll create a local scope variable here to check what it is. So we'll say dollar $val uh, delete class. What's the value that they typed into the delete class input field? We get that from selecting Found ID delete in delete class. In this case, we don't have to do that target the, the element that exists before targeting the element that doesn't exist. Because by the time we get to the delete class function, everything should exist. The only reason you, you are able to use the delete class button is because it's been revealed when we do show class. And by that time, then this id, this in delete class element does exist. So we don't have to do anything fancy here, we can just select it. jQuery selector to find i, to find in, sorry, in delete class, not id, in delete class. Right, that's... And that's what we call it, input delete class. So what they typed into the input box, we're retrieving it, dot val like before. Val method. Yes? Um, when there is a, a 
about the um, the theory to uh, compute a uh, and the result, which is this maturation. Mm. Because like how then the result is because of the ID, right? The maturation. You mean comparing the one up here with the one we just wrote? That's why, yeah. No, but, but that's what I just said. That Yeah, that's true. It doesn't exist. Uh, but the only reason we're able to use function delete is because of our code up here where we create the button to delete. By the time it's created, which is right here, it has created the input to delete. So we're able to... Yes. That's, that's why I, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you prepare ID using the new question, that's my mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Question over here, James? OK, so just to see if it's working, let's do some console output before we actually make it do what it's supposed to do, because then more lines are coming up. All I'm trying to do here is, OK, what is, did we, are we actually retrieving a real value here? Is it working at this point? Uh, whatever the value of what they typed into the field, we're storing it. Show me in the console. So uh, let's save it and run it. Uh, show your classes. Type the CRN of one of the ones you want to delete. It won't delete it yet. But type one of the CRNs and click that delete button. It won't delete it yet, but click it. And then in the console, you should see what you typed into that field. That's all to check that our button, our, our, our event handler is working. That's also to check that our jQuery selector is working to retrieve the value. If those aren't working, we'll, we'll check them. But let me confirm. So I'll pull up my console. I'll show my classes. Let's say I want to get rid of class because it's easier to type 002. And I'll click delete class. It's saying, yeah, you're trying to delete class 002. That's what I typed in here. Yes? What kind of error is being put back in there? Unfortunately, Unfortunately, some of these errors are going to be silent errors. They're not, it's not actually going to tell you anything. That happens when, when we often deal with, you know, with jQuery where we're trying to select elements that don't exist. If I'm trying to, you know, do the in delete class and it never existed, I might get an error that says, you know, reference to undefined element. Or if I mistype my functions, it might tell me that. Sometimes I don't get any feedback at all, and that's that's then harder to figure out what my error was. I have to go backwards. Do you have that issue right now? And so I, I would go backwards. What's the last thing I did? I'm going to double check my code. What's the second last thing? I'm going to check my code. I'm going to select my elements and kind of follow the chain back to try to figure out the problem. So hopefully at this point, uh, you, you type something here, and it shows it in the console. I type class 33j, it showed me 33j. However, in the database, 333 capital J, and I type 33 lowercase j, different. If I try to delete that, it'll say this class doesn't exist. There's no class 33j, but there is a class 33j, uppercase, lowercase. So if we are able to retrieve what they typed in here, let's do two uppercase. Remember that? We forced all of these to uppercase at one point. We then need to force whatever they type here to uppercase so that they match. That j is uppercase, that j is lowercase. They will not delete. They don't match. So if we were able to retrieve the class before the console output, we can do a val delete class equal to val delete class dot to uppercase. 
method. Whatever the current value of delete class, I just retrieve, send it to uppercase, force it to uppercase, restore it into our variable, and then show it. So then that 33j should become capital 33j. Here we are, uh, retrieve value of input field to delete, then uh, con convert to uppercase. Yes.
So if we got it up to this point, we have confirmed that we've dynamically created an input field and a button. We've created a way for it to be triggered that when you click on it, something will happen. We have confirmed that we've retrieved what they've typed into the input field. Now we need to do something with it. What we've got in that input field is, a, is an ID, an underscore ID, which is typed to the CRM. The way this works, in PouchDB, if we look at the documentation, we simply have the db.remove, but it's better practice to check that what we're trying to remove exists first before deleting it. I may be trying to delete a class that doesn't exist. I have a class 002. I may accidentally be trying to delete class 0002. So we want to check if what we're trying to delete does exist before deleting it. That's next here. After this console output, db.get. .get, remember we had all docs to retrieve everything from the database. .get is to retrieve one item from the database. This is the way for us to check. Does the thing we're trying to delete exist in the database? We're going to first try to get what we're trying to delete. What we're trying to delete is $val delete class, the ID that they typed into the field. Like everything else, then we get a failure or success. So comma, function, parentheses, curly braces, failure, comma, success the two possible results of pretty much everything we do in PouchDB. Yes? While and which one? While... Well, let me. What? Can't quite hear you. So, which which of the lines? So, like, what's the idea? Okay, so db.get, we're trying to get the, the element that they, or the value that they typed in, and the result is a function with either failure or success. So we have the function, there's either a failure or a success. Then we'll do the if else. If there was a failure, this, if, or else there wasn't that. So we'll break those curly braces there. And we will do if else. So I'm going to break that into multiple lines. This one's going to get a little complex, so I'm also going to put here 
uh, and dot get. Just a quick note for myself, this is the get. Because ultimately, if we did get properly, then we actually then eventually have to dot remove. So we're going to have these opening and closing parentheses and curly braces, and it might be useful to note that. So what comes here inside now is an if, else, and if. Because if I see these right here without any context, I'm going to lose track of what they are. And if I'm adding more code later, I may put it in the wrong spot. That's the end of get, that's the end of if. If failure x else success y. All right, so with failure, it's always useful to start off with some console output to try to troubleshoot it. Obviously, if we're following along in the lecture, I have most of the contingencies figured out already since I've done this several times. But if you're doing this yourself, then uh, it's good to do a little console log output for yourself to try to troubleshoot. Okay, so we got a failure. What's the failure? We'll output that to the console to try to figure it out and read the documentation, and we'll try to figure it out. Uh, for the user, perhaps at this point we don't have much to, to go on just yet, but we'll give the user an alert. Let's say error. Contact the developer. And then the actual else is where the good stuff happens. If we get to else, that means, yes, we're trying to retrieve, we're trying to get something that does exist in the database. Here, I guess, we could also alert that class doesn't exist, or we could say something like that. Before we do else, actually, what we what we can do is let's. Uh, that's 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 the possibility that we may have that we're trying to delete a class that doesn't exist. So let's give a better error than this glib one. So what I'll say is instead we'll have it say uh, error. Your class does not exist. What they tried what they typed in there doesn't exist. So we'll say error, the class x doesn't exist. We'll say error, the class x doesn't exist. Yes? Exactly. This is first checking if that underscore ID does exist in the database. Not if there's an error in the database, just that what we're trying to delete, does it exist or not in the database? Error, the class x doesn't exist. This will be dynamic, like what we did with the for loop. Show a string plus dynamic plus a string. So that x there is just a placeholder, so that I can close the string there, add the dynamic part, and then add the rest of the string. So in here, we're going to display the class that they're trying to delete. Val delete class.
Under the else, we'll give ourselves some quick, quick feedback about to delete class now delete class. So here's a spot where we can pause to test it. If I save it and run it and I put in a CRN that does not exist, I should trigger the failure and it will pop up error. The class 222 does not exist. If you are trying to delete a class in your database that does exist in your console, for the moment you will see you're about to delete the class whatever you typed. Try that. Let me confirm mine and then I'll put the code back. So I'm going to try to delete class T, Y, X, whatever. I know it doesn't exist. So I'm going to try to delete some class. Click delete, pop up. The error, the class, blah, 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 doesn't exist. And I need some spaces there for readability. Then if I'm trying to delete class 002, my console says about to delete class 002. So error, the class blah, 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 doesn't exist. I need a space there and a space there, or else this will just run together as one, one word. Here's how I, I triggered the failure on purpose. I'm trying to delete a class. I'm trying to get a class, not delete yet. I'm trying to get a class that doesn't exist. That was a failure. So it says, there's your class you're not that doesn't exist. I'm trying to delete a class that does exist. I'm trying to get a class that doesn't exist. Success. Else. Console. So the actual command that removes data from the database is db.remove. So inside of the else, that's the part that confirms a success, db, the database object, dot remove method. What we're trying to remove then is val delete class. And it has a result as always function failure success. So the dot remove, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. But we shouldn't try to do that before checking by retrieving, by doing get. I'm going to break those curly braces and add comment and of dot remove. and another if-else. So I have another if-else, and I added the comma, this is the end of if from remove, 
I, I further change my comment for myself down there. That's the end of if from get. Once again, here the possibilities of remove are failure and success. For that failure, I, I'll just copy the exact same up here from this first from this first failure. It's the same thing. Put something in the console for me and alert the user it's the same thing. If we got to this point, we're trying to delete a class. It's very, very unlikely that we would get to this failure. By the time we get to remove, we can only get to remove if there was a success above there. So I think it's highly unlikely to get to this failure. Something may have happened in the millisecond between this and this. I doubt we would ever be able to trigger this second failure, but I'll put something there. I'll copy what was there on the previous failure. And this final else, by the time we get to this final else, we have removed the data. We're in a position that we have to remove data. We have correct data. So that else there will, by the time we get to that else, the data is removed. It's also a good idea then, at that moment, show an updated version of the table. The table is not dynamic at the moment. The table, the table itself on screen is still going to show what you just deleted. It doesn't delete until you refresh it, until you re-show the table. So our function show, show class is in charge of that. So in this else, function show class. ultimately redraw the table. Redraw the table with the new data in the database, which is missing one item that I just deleted. If I don't refresh the table, people will say, I thought I deleted it. They did. It's deleted from the database, but not deleted from the table. And it's just super easy to redraw the table with one less row. All right, let's see if that works. Save it and run it. We should have already gone through the, through the testing of trying to delete something that doesn't exist. So try to delete something that does exist. And ultimately, it just does it. It just deletes it. We have all of these levels of if, else, dot get, dot remove as the process to ultimately get a result, a removed class. So show my classes. I don't want class 657 anymore. Click delete class. Oops. Need to type it properly. 657567 delete. Hmm. Okay, I see what it is. Um, okay. Here's the issue. The, uh, the part up here. I was uh, actually doing uh, a live guinea pig test and we failed. Uh, this right here. So we're saying db.remove, delete the class in question. I was checking to see if we could further keep using val delete class, but actually we have to use success, failure success. So we're going to actually remove success. The reason for that is a class, an object, is made out of more than just its ID. It's also got its revision and all of the data. 
So I'm trying to remove the object completely. Right now, the object completely is success. So db remove success. It might not have made sense to do it the first time. That's why I did it the wrong way for a moment to confirm. It should be this. We're trying to remove the success object, which is what we're trying to delete plus other metadata, basically. that. Trying to remove class 657, class 67. Delete. The table redraws. Nothing really happens too much in the console right now. About to delete class 6 whatever and then the table redraws because it's gone from the database. So let's say I have, you know, class ZZZ. I save that. I have to click show class. So I've got class ZZZ. Okay, I'm going to delete class ZZZ. Delete class. It's gone. Table redraws. It would be nice that if I add a new class that it also redrew it. We might have the knowledge right now how to do that. I have to click show class manually, but there might be a way for, to, for it to automatically show class again. Redraw the table, exactly. So when I delete the class here, I'm redrawing the table. So why don't you go back to show class and have it redraw the table? I'll do that in a moment. But here I added another class of gibberish, so just to further test it paste that in and delete it and it's gone. Class 555. This is telephony 101 was instructor Jones. Show class. So I've got a new row to delete. But if I want the table to automatically refresh itself, function show class does that. Now that it exists, now that we've defined that function, we didn't have it when we first set things up. So function show class, I'm going to copy that, and when we have uh, db put, db.put, all works for errors and for success. It cleans out the input form. And then also redraw the table. So as soon as we add something to the database, back on db put, line 93 or so, let's also then redraw the table. Now that we have a function that draws the table. To this point now, when I added that redraw, uh, I'm going to add a brand new class, uh, 234x something something go. As soon as I click go, it shows the table. I don't have to click show classes. If I want to, I can click show classes the first time and it shows the classes. Now when I add a class, <coughs> and go, it adds it right away. Shows it. 
is my data so far. So we are adding data to the database, deleting data, we'll take a break, and then we will do editing data. This is empty. I forgot to type the class name and the instructor. This, my cat walked on the keyboard, so type something else. I want to edit that. Let's do one thing, then we'll take a break. I want to I'll make ourselves this one a little bit easier. I want to have a pencil next to a row to click the row to edit the row. So let's go back quickly to our table here, create a new column and a new column where we can then add a pencil to edit a particular row. We don't have jQuery mobile, so we don't have data icon equals pencil, but we have some built-in uh, characters embedded into UTF-8 that we can reference. So let's back up into our code to where we are creating the table, which is line uh, 133 or so. This is the part, well not there, right there, 125. Back where we've got show class table. This is where we actually build a row of data. But we need it in, in two places. We need a heading and we need um, the actual row. On line 125, where we've got our headings, we've got a heading for CRN, a heading for class, a heading for instructor. Let's create a new heading. We simply need that to be an empty space in that heading. So ampersand NBSP semicolon. That's non-breaking space. Our new heading, CRN, class, instructor, empty. That will become an empty space, but we need a column header first. And it will actually create the cell down here. So we need a, an empty heading first. NBSP, non-breaking space. So there's our there's our ID, CRN, there's our class, class, <coughs> there's our instructor. Let's add another at the end of that, inside of the for loop. So we've got doc C inst, doc C class, doc C inst. So we need another TD. Another plain cell, table data, a cell. Inside of the cell, we can create a pencil by typing pound, I mean, I mean ampersand, so the and symbol, then pound, then x270e, semicolon. Yes, I have that memorized. No, I'm not looking at notes. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's going to create a pencil. We can go look it up, you know, UTF character set, UTF-8 character set, and there's pencils, and there's like smiley faces and hearts. There's all of these basic emoji before emoji got hot with all of these nice icons. Those are kind of plain. Later on with jQuery Mobile, we can add a nicer kind of pencil, but that will create a pencil. So I'm going to have a pencil there. Now to have this further work, we'll do it now and then we'll take our, our break. Uh, these pencils, I want to click a pencil to be able to edit that row. We have multiple rows. If I want to target something that exists in multiple ways, instead of a, an ID, what do I need? Class. A class. ID equals something is one thing only. Class equals something is multiple things. I'm going to have multiple pencils. A pencil at the end of each row. So we need to then attach a class. Where's your pencil? I need to attach a class to each of these. So when I click this, 
pencil, my JavaScript recognizes it to, to, to edit this row. If I click this pencil, the JavaScript will recognize this row. So all of these need a class, the same class. <laughs> Make sure that's a zero. <laughs> it's a zero, yes. 270E. If it doesn't work, I'll check you in a moment, but it's pound, it's ampersand pound x 270E. Okay, so we'll attach a class to that to that cell back up to the beginning of the TD and we'll add the class attribute single quotes uh, btn pencil it's not quite a button doesn't matter but okay, here's our button for the pencil so that by a javascript we would be able to click any of those pencils to target a particular row and now let's take a break let's uh, save that see if it works after the break we'll Start to set this up. It's about 8.40. We'll take a break until 8.50. If anyone needs any help, call me over. I'm going to put my code up to this point in the network folder. I forgot to do it on the last break. But I'll put my code up to this point in the folder if you want it. It's got today's date, temp.